Well, this is fucking crazy. Fuck. We're live. <laughs> We're live. Hey, everybody. Mark Agnesi here for Gibson Guitars. I am live today with my friend from Phil X and the Drills, Bon Jovi, and the recent star of Gibson TV's Riff Lords, Phil X. What's Riff Lords! Yeah, yeah. What's happening, dude? I'm good, man. Doing? I've been good. It's, it's a crazy time to like try to have a normal life, but uh, I've been doing sessions and, and uh, writing and working and being a dad, and that's the saving grace of not being on tour right now is being a dad and seeing my kids grow up, so that's, that's pretty cool. Cool. Well, while we're letting some people join in here, we'll just get all the quarantine COVID catch-up stuff out of the way here. Okay. Uh, everybody I've talked to has told me two, one of two things. Like, they've just been watching Netflix, or the other thing is this has been, like, the most productive time of their entire life, and they've gotten more stuff done creatively oh, yeah. than ever. Is, uh, are you the latter on that? Um, I think you have to, right? I mean, I, I wake up every morning it's it's almost like an emotional tragedy that i think about not being on stage until next year and that's that's a challenge so being able to do stuff like this and i do live chats on my app every tuesday and it kind of gives me it kind of gives me like i'm not it's not an audience per se like in your face and yelling and singing along to the words but it's it's an outlet so as long as I have an outlet, I'm I'm pretty happy. Yeah. Where were you supposed to be right now? Are you were you supposed to be out on the road right now? I want to say Madison Square Garden. Probably sold out multiple nights in a row. Two nights sold out Madison Square. I should have, I think it I think it was around this time. Um, and I would have been in I would have been in my hometown of Toronto earlier in July, which you know my mom goes to every Toronto show, so she's like in the. In the and I was sitting right there while I'm playing Wanted Dead or Alive. So it's when she's got a big smile on her face and it's amazing. So it's tough to not have, have that on, on the calendar. Yeah, that is tough. Well, hey, for everyone who's joining us now, I'm here with Phil X from Phil X and the Drills. What's been going on with the Drills, man? You guys are doing all sorts of stuff online right now. We have to. Got to keep the fans, you know, got to keep the content flowing. So we, um, we put out a single and a, uh, a video. And what we did with the video was, I call it the quarantine slash fan video. Cause not only we couldn't play in the same room. So I was here in LA and, and Dan was in Burbank, but our drummer Brent Fitz was in Winnipeg. Like, <laughs> Whoops. See the headstocks are durable. Dude, it's totally in one piece and in tune. Um, and in tune. So and so Brent Fitz was in Winnipeg, and uh, that uh, so there's shots of him, shots of Dan, shots of me, and then uh, I have a I launched an app a couple of months ago, and we have premier members. So I was like, hey, if you guys send in a video of you singing the chorus, we'll put it in the video. So right. we we ended up doing that, and uh, I think the last count I had of fans in the video was 50. So that was a lot of editing and a lot of uh, shortening and a lot of sticking in there and all that stuff yeah somebody just asked a question over here when is the uh when's the record coming out the new phil x and the drills album well we wanted to keep the same team like it's the, the, the flow of volume one and one volume two is obviously the common denominator are me and dan uh, me on guitar obviously and dan on bass and me singing lead him singing backgrounds and the drummer on the, each song a different drummer so volume two is going to be the same Chris Lord LG mixed volume one and we want him to mix volume two and he's a busy guy. So we're just, it's everything's been recorded. We're just waiting for next time. So we're hoping before Christmas, it'll come out. Um, we are going to put out another single by the end of the summer. Um, it's a song called, I love you on her lips. Well, let me rephrase that. I love you in quotes and on her lips. Um, so that song is going to be coming out and, uh, it's a it's a kill it's a killer too, man. We we've been uh, doing a lot of stuff. Uh, we did shows in the UK in um, in March, and just to give everybody an idea of what to expect, Dan wrote a song. And Dan's never written a song, a drill song. So I mean, he's co-written. And hey, man, what do you think of this chorus? He goes, "That's cool, but uh, I think you should change that chord." And then I'm like, "Okay, well, there you." You got a little bit of writing there. So anyways, he wrote a song and he sent it to me and it was for a solo project. 
And he said, hey, man, what do you think of this tune? I go, I think it's great. It's going on a Nesk Drills record. And he's like, dude, but it's a Dan song. And I'm like, yeah, it's going to be a Dan Drill song. So I stole his song, not the copyright and publishing, just yeah, I stole the, music, the, the song and we recorded it with Ryan McMillan at uh, 606 Studios in Northridge a couple of years ago. And so just to give everybody a tease of that, we played that in the show and it got a great response. And Dan's awesome, man. I, he's my, I call him my left wing for life. No matter who's playing drums, Dan is the glue between me and the drummer. Yeah. Yeah. Well, just for everybody out there, I'm just here as a moderator. So if you guys have questions for Phil, go ahead and put them in the, uh, the comments section there. And uh, I'll kind of peek through them here and make sure that uh, Phil gets asked all the stuff you guys want to know until we get some uh, more questions rolling in. Welcome to Gibson, man. I know it's it, we welcomed you at Nam, which was nuts, and then all of this happened. Wait, wait. How about that showcase, dude? Come on. Okay, if anyone who wasn't at the Nam show when Phil X and the Drills went on stage, it was so packed that everything started to f flow out into the lobby. So I went back into the lobby, and there was probably four hundred people packed. In the fire marshals were freaking out. Nobody could walk through. There was no fire lanes. There was probably 1,200 people trying to catch a glimpse from any angle of your guys' set, which was killer. We we killed it. I, I felt good. I mean, you know, when you walk off stage and sometimes you have an essence of that was a good show or that was a bad show or it's an okay show. And I walked off going, oh, my God, we just – It was a good one. Face. It was a punch in the face. 20 minutes. But yeah, I remember. That was a, it was a packed 20 minutes. You guys were doing medleys. Uh, there was like five or six songs woven together into songs. And it was it was incredible, man. Is that part of the regular yeah. drills live experience? The kind of medleys of, of, of other teams? Yeah. We, we, we've always done like, you know, like I just posted on Instagram the other day. Every, we've been doing this fire finale for like years, like probably going over over into like 12 years. We've been doing this. Hendrix, Hendrix's version of Fire, but really fast. And at the end, the medley solo is like, it starts with a theme from the Flintstones and then it goes into Gilligan's Island. And then when I do Beat It from uh, Michael Jackson, you know, the Eddie Van Halen solo, and then the solo from Crazy Train. And the thing is, it's so fast. I'm like, every time I think, man, I gotta throw something else in there. I, I, I talk myself out of it because my hands, my left hand's already dying after Crazy Train that fast. So I'm like, uh, yeah, let's not throw anything else in there. <laughs> and you're singing on top of it. So yeah, yeah there's a guy on stage during a drill show. I figure if I'm exhausted after a show, the, the, sh the band should be exhausted too. <laughs> Everybody's in it together. And the thing about fire too is like, I, I don't, I don't really like doing an encore because I have to, I have to follow, follow fire. And I feel like I can't follow myself. <laughs> well, hey, I got some questions coming in here. Before we get to that, I just want to ask some Gibson questions because now you're uh, you're on our team here. You've got a lot of different Gibson guitars in the arsenal there. Have you been gravitating to one particular shape or have you just been kind of floating around through all of them? You know what? I love, uh, I've been, I took two of these on the drills tour. Actually, my son keeps stealing my action figure. Oh, action figure, yeah. So it was Boy Wonder, and then he stole, stole a Boy Wonder, and then he gave me Ant-Man. He goes, here, Dad, you can have Ant-Man. And then he's like, I want Ant-Man back. And I'm like, hey, man. So I have to find something that isn't his to stick in there. But uh, this thing with the PX100, this is made by Arcane, and uh, just a volume and a tone. And this is a rock and roll machine for me. I had two of these on tour with us in, in March. And it does everything I want because of the P90 style pickup. You know, if I want it really clean and spanky, I just turn down a little bit and it's there. And then when I want to rock out, when I, when the PX100, which is like I said, P90-ish on 10, is is angry to my to me. It's got an angst to it, and that's a lot of pickups don't deliver that. So that's why I love the P90 style. Um, and then again, I've been doing when I do sessions and stuff. Uh, the Les Paul comes in handy. I have two Les Pauls that I've been using. One is the, the 60, the, sorry, the 57 Gold Top Dark Bag. That is unbelievable. And a 59, the 60th anniversary 59 Custom. Those two guitars are ridiculous. Like, 
not only everybody talks about how do they stay in tune. I'm like, these, these things are set up. They stay in tune amazing. And I love that. Um, I have, I, I've been using a 59 custom shop, uh, ES335 and the one that's getting the big, the lip, cause I used it on the, uh, drill video or the 70 boy Explorer. Yeah. Someone was asking a question about it. It was amazing. And it was funny. It was, was when I was talking to Jim over at the factory, Jim DeCola. Yeah. He's like, I'm wait, I can't wait for you to hear this pickup. And I'm like, Oh really? So I plugged it in and I'm like, whoa, dude, this thing's kicking. Maybe I want another pickup for another guitar. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's Jim's secret sauce that's based off of decades Jim. of, Love of Jim. research on some famous, well, one in particular famous pickup that he's quite familiar with. But yeah, killer, killer sounding pickup. People yeah. keep talking about a, a Phil X signature model. If yeah. There was going to be, let's just say if there was going to be a Phil X signature model, what would you imagine in your mind that guitar would look like? You know, I've, I've, I've always loved the SG and everywhere I went, it was always about, you know, the double horns, right? <laughs> so I feel like, um, I feel like I love massive necks. I love the, the neck on the 57 gold top. And, yeah. uh, but I don't want to ruin the balance of this guitar. To me, this guitar is perfectly balanced. So if the neck was a little fatter, would it throw it off? Would it take a dive, you know? Yeah. So I think there's going to be a series of uh, prototyping kind of weight balance things. Um, I've talked to Cesar about, a, you know, do we want to put like a, a fill action figure in here? I love and the question. And it goes, hey, man. You know, it would be sick. So I think we're talking about something like that. Um, I also believe, uh, I feel like um, I have a 67 SG, and there's more mass behind the nut right here. There's a bigger heel. And I feel that when that's going down, you get more tone out of the notes. Yeah. So uh, we'll be talking about a, a bigger uh, neck joint. So, I mean, all these things. While I'm going through all these amazing guitars, I'm I'm collecting data. <laughs> yeah. What I really like about this and what I really like about that. And um, so far, it's just it's uh, I'm having a lot of fun. And then I, at some point, we'll be all FaceTiming about the Phil X signature. I can't wait. Well, hey, some questions are coming in. If you guys got questions for Phil X, go ahead there. Put them in the comment section. I'll try and get to all of them here. Um, Jimmy Martinez asked, what are some of your favorite bands? When you were growing up, um, dude, it was it was the you know we had a different um, top four. It was like Black Sabbath and ACDC and Van Halen and Zeppelin and uh, and the Who too. I mean, there was so much stuff. But I, I went through phases. Everybody goes through phases. One of my phases was uh, early Scorpions with Uli John Roth because he was in '76. He was doing stuff that nobody else was doing and and brought this kind of like speed picking thing to the forefront and a lot of guys got stuff from him like eddie Ingbe. um he was just one of those gut groundbreaking dudes um for me and people challenge this all the time but i challenge me only one my the guy to me who changed guitar more than anybody on the planet was eddie van halen because it was like not not the sounds i mean obviously this the, the obvious stuff is the sound and the technique and the, the licks that he was pulling out that nobody else was doing, and just the style of of being on fire, and 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 tight with the drums, all that stuff put into this thing. So not only that, but he changed the sound of guitar and he changed the look of a guitar, and and it just changed so much. So that for me was you know the top dude. Yeah. But uh, and then I started taking bazooki lessons when I was seventeen because I. I thought it would give me an edge over my rival gang members. Um, and uh, it did. It, I, it did something in my picking that, uh, that it just became, I, it became really articulate with the up and down speed picking. I heard you play on, on a six string guitar some of the Greek uh, kind of sounding like bazooki licks. Uh, yeah. I think I saw a video you doing some stuff. Are you plugged up right now? Are, are you warm up? Yeah. And warm up? 
Ooh, let me turn that down a little bit. So the um, the, th the thing with uh, so back up a little bit so people can see your hands, because uh, yeah, we're we're missing the hands. Okay, wait. Oh. Let's do the hand thing. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the guitar is too low. Okay, here we go. Um, okay, so stuff on bazooki could be kind of be like really dance oriented stuff, like it. But it could be like shreddy stuff, like this. It's like a. That kind of stuff. So all that stuff just came to be like you're playing. There's no dist. I suck now, <laughs> but what, like the there's no distortion and the strings are doubled like a twelve string. So it's four pairs, eight, and it's trying to shred on that. It's almost like trying to shred on a twelve string acoustic. Yeah. So, but the neck, you know, the body's smaller. The neck is is kind of like a broom handle. It's kind of small. But you get around it, and it's all about the picking. It's about the attack, and uh, it just did a number on my uh, a good number on my on my style as a picker. But uh, it's just pretty cool. I gotta see if I can lower this monitor so we can get more guitar. Hold on. Yeah. Uh, while we're doing that, uh, another came in kind of on the same topic. There, uh, there, right? Uh, Hold on a second here. Yeah. Okay. Much better. Well, hey, on that same topic, kind of, uh, Rob on YouTube said, uh, "What are some of the practicing routines, techniques that you find uh, give you the most significant impact in improving your playing?" For me, it's like uh, it's. Hold on, sorry, I'm trying to. For me, it's kind of like um. I don't practice per se, like instead of working on a, a scale or something that's more like, uh, um, uh, I, I come up, I've come up with a lick. Basically what I'll do is I write a song and then I'll come up with a solo for the song and I'll try to do something that I've never done before. And that's what feels really natural to me. So like, for instance, the, I do have to practice my own solos before I go on stage. One is, uh, my lighting is terrible. Um, the, uh, like for instance, I wish my beer was as cold as your heart. We have this, oh, do I have enough, uh, let's back up this way. So it's kind of like, uh, that kind of thing, I gotta practice that before I go on stage. And there are times where, like, if they don't nail it, I go, I stop the band. Hey, man, hold it, hold it, hold it. That solo's got to be bang on. So we do it again. But it's 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 one of those things. Like, that's a Phil X lick. And it's basically how I came up with that was I love dissonance. So, so it basically is. And it keeps going up. So it's just a slidey thing with a, a hammer on thing and a, and a dissonant thing. And I don't even know how, to, how, how else to describe it. But the dissonant thing, there's something in that. Uh, we have a song called Sunny Days too, where I do something like that. Something like that. So basically, I, I like to... I like to always have this thing happening that you can hear my influences because I'm not reinventing anything, but I, what struck me the most about somebody like Eddie Van Halen was his inventiveness. And I thought, well, I don't want to be a copycat. So I think I got to invent my own shit. And, that, and I was 16. So I was coming up with that stuff at that time. And I thought it was pretty important to be able to, uh, to do that. Yeah, yeah. And I think a lot more people should be doing that these days because I, I think uh, I see a lot of people that are like, you know, they have go to licks and go to sounds, and it's not it's not really doing anything, you know, new or different. 
I, I know who I like to listen to. And all those guys, especially on stage, you know, the guys that I grew up watching, like Ed and Angus Young and Jimmy Page, everybody had moves too. So you're on stage and you got moves. But all those guys had, like, it's a mashup. Ed's style with Angus's vibrato and some of Jimmy Page's tones. It's like everything, everybody, everything that I like about guitar, I, 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 I uh, incorporate into what I do. Yeah, yeah. Talking about it, you get stuck and you, you have your go to licks. Do you have any uh, recommendations for anybody out there who might be stuck in a rut where it's just like the same stuff keeps coming out? They're not, they're not progressing or they're not picking up anything new. How do you break yourself out of ruts once you find yourself in one? Well, one way, and a lot of people talk about it, is tunings. You know, if you try different open tunings, that, that comes in handy for on a like a writing aspect. But as far as playing goes, it's like it's just trying to get out of the box. Like I always um one of my my go to rut getter router of is uh just taking boxes and like we all know the boxes like let's do that. So we're doing you know like the pentatonic box. But if you take all those boxes and spread them out over two strings, you get that let me go uh, back there. So basically, you're taking the boxes and just spreading them out over two strings, and you can do that over any two strings. I'm doing it on E and B right now. But <clears throat> and I, I, I stuck that in a solo because I thought it sounded so good. It doesn't sound like an exercise when you do a slide. It's like it's all about timing. I think. <laughs> That kind of thing. So it sounds like a lick as opposed to an exercise. And then another thing is, uh, I do a lot of stuff where <clears throat> if you're in a box, we're in A now. This is a really simple string skip lick. Like, I'm, str I'm skipping the B string. But I, I like to see where that would go. That's kind of like, oh, okay. So I took one lick and just moved it around. It's almost like an image. It's almost like copy and paste or a copy machine. It, I do that in um, um, in another drill song. It's in F sharp. So just taking one lick and moving it around and see where it, where it works. Sometimes you end up with something that doesn't sound so good, but then other times it adds a little uh, character to uh, something that usually doesn't have character. Hey guys, if you got questions for Phil, go ahead and put them in the uh, in the comments. There, we'll get to them. I've got one here from Doug Floyd saying, "Have Phil uh, run down his recording chain? What's uh, what's coming uh, out of that SG? What are you going into usually?" Oh, this is, my live chat. this is my live chat rig. <laughs> it's a uh, Hughes and Kettner Tube Meister because I can set it at five watts and it doesn't rip people's heads off. Yeah. But um, my recording chain usually like. Uh, the stuff that I've been putting up on YouTube is primarily my uh, my Friedman Signature X amp, 100 watt head, and it goes into a 412 cabinet that I have in an ISO box from the tour outside the window because it doesn't fit in the front door. So it's a good thing we got a little like canopy out there; it doesn't get wet. Um, and then the the floor is a massive mess of pedals, like, and it's like if I'm recording something, I don't. I'd rather use a, a, an analog pedal than a plug-in. If somebody says, hey, I need a little, little delay part, I'd like to use a, a pedal. So, and lately I've been using um, the Strymon Dig and the, uh, the Digitech Rubberneck. Those two are awesome as floor echo. It's, they're both unbelievable. And they, they both do different things, so it's really awesome. Um, Overdrive-wise, I've been really digging the... Uh, the Laney Steel Park. Um, I used it on the last tour. That that thing sounds really good. Um, I also use. There's two more that I use a lot. One is the Way Huge Custom Saucy Box. Um, there was a little mod in it made for me because I wanted it a little more open sounding. So George Trip over there, he made me one, and I use that all the time. And then another one that I've been having fun with is the Duelist, which does some great things. I, I don't. I I think if your amp sounds amazing, you don't want your overdrive to take over. 
I think you just want a little more. Yeah. And it's, it's, transparency is a big thing for me when it comes to overdrive pedals. A really good overdrive pedal that's very transparent is the Greer Lightspeed, that one too. So I use, depending on what I'm feeling or what the track needs, sometimes you need a, di a different overdrive to cut through what else is happening on, on the track. Um, and guitar-wise, I've been using nothing but um, sometimes I need to use a single coil, and sometimes I'll cheat that. If I, <laughs> if I go, oh, man, this needs a telly, I just take the guitar with the P90 and turn it down a little bit. That sounds enough like a telly <laughs> to get away with it. But uh, I've been using... Um, uh, I have a junior SG that I, I love a lot, and uh, the, the I have this really amazing ES355. That's a natural, and that thing just I use it for arpeggiated overdubs, and it sounds incredible. It sounds like bells. And uh, what else do I got going here? Um, I record into Pro Tools, and that's about it, man. I mean, when I, I have a, a double neck for when I need a twelve string part, I have a double neck. And I have my custom made Scala Flying V that gives me a different flavor with that P90 into a different shape. It sounds way different than the SG with the uh, with the P90 as well. So um, we're cooking, cooking. Oh, wow. and that black one there too. Keithy, very Keith. The three five five. Um, yeah, it's uh, that thing's incredible. It's a black beauty of three five fives. Nice. Are you always chasing gear? Are like pedals and stuff? Are you always looking at new stuff? Do you kind of have the stuff that you like, or are you always trying new stuff out? Man, you know, it's it's a. I think we're the new nerd. I think guitar players are. It's like if there's another Revenge of the Nerds movie, it's going to be about guitar players because it's all about guitars and pedals. And you know, I, I've seen some people geek out more than me, and I, I geek out. But Sean Shanks is a way bigger geek than I am. He's got more pedals than most people have seen in their life. I know. Eric Johnson is a geek beyond, he's beyond John Shanks. So when you talk to these guys, you kind of feel like, oh, I feel like a newbie. <laughs> but um, I think, I don't know, man. I feel like people that call themselves uh, tone chasers, I mean, how is that possible? Like, so, so much that's amazing. Like, it's easy to get a great guitar tone. It's harder to get a great guitar tone that has character and speaks and says something else than just, oh, here's the chorus, man. Let's make it big, fat chords. That's that's not what it's about for me. It's about something that has character and says something to complement the vocal that's going on. And then any, anything that goes on top of that has to not only, well, I can't hear it because it's people think, well, I can't hear that part. It needs to be louder. If It usually doesn't have to be louder. It needs to be a different guitar and a different amp because it's competing. You can't put Marshalls on top of Marshalls. You gotta put something else on top of there. That's my feeling anyways, but it's it's worked out pretty good so far. Going back to the P90 thing, come on on Facebook said, uh, why are you such a big fan of P90s? What's the main appeal over humbuckers? For me, it's uh, the way they cut. The way they cut in a mix, the way they, the way they just, I, I explained it earlier, I feel like, it sounds like an angry pickup. It sounds angry, like it's on fuck yeah. That's the pickup to me. And then when you turn it down a little bit, you kind of, it, it approaches like a Strat or a Tele kind of vibe. And then if you turn it down a lot, it's a beautiful spanky clean, clean sound. That's my clean sound. I, I use a one channel amp, and then this is my clean sound right here. Turn it down. You can't see it, there we go. You turn down a little bit. And that's, and that's my clean sound. And I've had people come up to me and go, hey man, how's that? How's that? Uh, how, do you, how do you get that clean tone? I go, I just turn the guitar down. But the amp has to be a special amp too. Um, I remember pulling into a gig one time, and I had uh, a guitar with a PX100 in it, like this, and then a second guitar that had a humbucker. And the opening act walked in and goes, "Man, I really thought that the P90 guitar was going to be your backup guitar." But then you just play the P90 all night, and you've got every rock tone I've ever wanted to get achieve out of that one guitar. And that was a testament to the P90 for me. Like, I, I know about this, so I'm just spreading the word, man. I'm spreading the gospel of the P90. Um, this is going to repeat question that I just got to ask you. It's, uh, Bill, what is your hair care process? Are you a mane and tail kind of guy, or what uh, What do you got working there for hair? Hair uh, care. 
I I watched it last night and I slept on it and I don't give a shit. I mean, <laughs> if okay, I'll tell you what though. If you're watching a live chat or a video that I've done and I'm wearing a hat, that's because it's a bad hair day. Because <laughs> it occasionally does happen. It's like it's so flat. Like I don't know what, e what would even happen in right now, but that's that's uh, I'm not wearing a hat, so I guess it's okay. There's another one that just came in uh, from Todd on YouTube. Uh, are you currently writing any music with Bon Jovi right now? No. Um, actually, the, there is a new record coming out, but John uh, John wrote all the songs with uh, either Shanks or Billy Falcon, and uh, he's got a vision, man. Like he actually he actually likes the drills. He comes in one day and he was saying, "Man, I really." dig that tune and how the Joe's doing. And we talk about it all the time, but it's not, I don't think it's up his alley as far as writing goes. I mean, I've written in many styles, but usually what comes out of my mouth lyrically is um, interpretive. I love interpretive lyrics. I love reading between the lines. And I love when people come up to me and go, what did you mean by that lyric? And I'm like, what did you think I mean? I meant, what do you think I meant? And they tell me, and I'm like, wow, that's better than what I thought. So I'm going to stick with that. But I think I think the way John approaches lyrics is everything's like spelled out. He's completely opposite. So he just there is no there is no like mystery uh, as as opposed to me. There could be like when I have a song like "Kiss Kiss My Troublemaker," everybody has a, the idea that it's uh, an innuendo for you know oral yeah. Stuff. But it's not, it's about taking chances and you don't really get anywhere in life unless you take risks. So that's what the song is about for me. And uh, that's a perfect example, actually. Uh, Lucas from Facebook asked, how long did you have to practice until you could play smooth and fast? Like how long was it before you were starting to sound like Phil X as a kid? Um, it was a few years, but it was back years ago. Like, I mean, I'm 54 now. Woo, what? And uh, when I was 16 to 18, 19, I was, pr I was probably playing like eight hours a day. Like when I was 18, you could gig in Canada. So I would do three nights, Friday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday at a club, three 45 minute sets. And then when everybody else went to party, I would play guitar. I would woodshed until like, until I fell asleep at five or six. And then I'd get up at noon and play until we went on. I would be playing all the time. And I think, Maybe that's not what you have to do, but it definitely worked for me because I had this thing called Conquer the Lick. And I've, I've mentioned this before, but for the newbies, I had this thing called Conquer the Lick. And I would come up with a stupid lick that was almost impossible to play. And then I wouldn't put the guitar down until I nailed it. And sometimes it took 45 minutes and some, sometimes it took six hours. So that's what, you know. And I'll give you another example. I, I've become a worse guitar player since I became a dad because I don't practice that much because I'm usually doing yeah. daddy stuff. Yeah. The really cool thing about daddy stuff is it's, it's inspiring. So when I do pick up a guitar, uh, I'm coming up with different stuff all the time. So that's really cool. But like I did this, it was funny because I, I put up one of the first videos I put up when I was started doing more content for YouTube for the Phil X 1111 channel was I did a cover of Highway Star because somebody sent me the bed tracks of the original record. So I had um, Roger Glover on bass and Ian Pace on drums. And I'm like, I'm gonna play to this. Let's do Highway Star. And I sang and played it. And before I did the solo, I think I put the kids to bed and I'd come down in the living room and put a movie on and practice that good keyboard solo. I'm doing this, uh, this string, uh, string skipping thing. I'm going to try to play like this. A lot of people are like, hey, you can do the breakdown. So like, so that's like. That kind of thing is happening. Now, I nailed it so good. <laughs> in that video that I hit a bad chord afterwards and I'm like, just keep going, man, just keep going. And I even glitched in the actual guitar solo. But I'm like, forget it, dude. You'll never, ever, ever get that keyboard solo that good. Just don't stop. So that was my whole mentality doing the whole thing. And then when you start thinking that, that's when you start glitching. You gotta like roll, you get 
recover and keep going. But me, I'm like, oh man, I didn't hit that note. Oh man, I didn't. Oh man, that was sloppy. Uh, but the keyboard's are low, so keep going. <laughs> I mean, um, whatever it takes, right? Yeah. Just real quick, Andre from Facebook asks, what What are your favorite strings? What kind of strings are you using these days? Um, I've been doing. I've been using. Uh, I've been messing around because I've been using um, for years, probably fifteen years. I was using clear tone strings, and uh, even before they were clear tone, and they were. Uh, B-52s or red or rockers. So, um, but I've been messing around with uh, some different brands and um, I've been really digging, uh, when I was using 10 to, 10 to 46, the clear tones were awesome. And then when I, I switched to 9.5 to 44, cause I'm getting old and my left hand is like, dude, what's, no man, I can't do it. So, but nines are too light. So I started using nine and nine and a halfs. And I, I kind of like the clear tone nine and a halfs that they made special for me. But then when I tried Ernie Ball nine and a halfs, I was like, wow, these feel way better. So there's a couple of discussions that are gonna happen yeah. <laughs> in, this, in this quarantine phase of life. Um, Christopher on Facebook asked, uh, Phil, how do you feel about people saying rock is dying? Is there something that is going to push you? Is that something that pushes you creatively? Um, I want, I'm just going to segue into the drill shows again that happened in the UK in, uh, in March. We did eight, and then we were supposed to move on to go to, to, uh, to Europe to do another eight shows. And but the COVID thing kicked in, so we had to come home. So it was a bad, hey, we're going to Amsterdam. Uh, no, we're going home. So it kind of sucked. It was a, a letdown. And for the fans, too. But I got to tell you, man, when we, I don't care if it's 150 people or 300 people in a club watching the drills, um, they leave like they've been rocked. And to me, that's that says a lot. They're buying tickets. They're buying T-shirts. They're buying, buying VIP packages. We give a... In our VIP package, you get you come to Soundcheck and we play whatever you want. We do requests, and that's that's what we like to do. So these people, and there were people that came to all eight shows. Um, that's there is no identifiable example of rock being dead in that capacity. So, and then last June, I mean, shit, man, I played Wembley Stadium <laughs> with with. Uh, a year ago with Bon Jovi and that was 82,000 people. It wasn't, it wasn't a festival. It was Bon Jovi with a local opener, 82,000 people at Wembley Stadium. And I mean, for someone to say that rock is dead, like the, the songs that they get most excited about are one of the best rock songs ever written, which is Living on a Prayer and One of Dead or Alive. When we kick into those songs, those audiences get so electric. Like I've never seen anything like it before. So. There's two examples, one on a small scale, one on a large scale. That was a long answer. I apologize. It's all good. Uh, tell me a little bit more about Wembley. What's it like to play Wembley? How much gear do you need to bring? Is it the same rig or are you bringing extra stuff? Is that stage? It's so massive. Like, what is it's, that whole Wembley experience like? Well, I mean, it's not my, we don't. The Bon Jovi thing isn't in my ideal uh, stage setup. Like my cabinets are in ISO boxes, like the one outside. Yeah, the stage is pretty bare, right? It's not bare like the part. Yeah, and nobody wants to hear the guitar cabinets, so they're in ISO boxes off stage or under the stage, and that sucks because when you're trying to get a it doesn't happen. So in ears, I'm not a big fan, but that's how this band rolls. So uh, that's what we do. Uh, so I mean, you could be, you could have like a, a, a tiny little, yeah, yeah. inch speaker amp off the off stage with a mic on it, and you, you could do Wembley Stadium. My favorite part about Wembley Stadium was I took the tube to the gig because I had a friend with me, Carl, who was also uh, uh, the drills road manager in M March. Carl Costa Grande. He goes, "Hey man, we could get in the car. Let's go into the gig." But we could take the tube, like the underground 
some way. We could take the tube and be there in like 15 minutes. And I'm like, well, let's do that. So we grabbed a couple of other people that had to go. We took the train. And I think people were looking at me, but they're like, no, it can't be him. He, he wouldn't be on the tube. And then when, so we got off the tube and then you have to go down their stairs, these stairs, and then our security guy is waiting because there's no way they want me to walk to the venue from the station by myself. So the security guy is waiting for me. But this girl walks up to me and she goes, hey, are you, uh, are you little X or are you just little blank? And I'm like, I get that a lot. <laughs> I kept walking. So, um, yeah, and then you can't stop because if you stop, then, then it, the, a line starts. One person wants a picture, and then even like a Starbucks becomes a, a, a meet and greet. So you got you to gotta pick who you let take a picture or like, hey, if you keep it quiet, we could do a photo right now. Yep. Uh, going back to the rock is dead thing. Uh, Alona from Facebook asks, have you discovered any new bands lately that you're really into? That's a good question. And the answer is no. <laughs> no. Hey, okay. There are bands. That I think like the newer bands, I think there are bands that are close. Like, or if some, if like my opinion, I don't think it matters because there, a band came out a few years ago, Foxy Shazam, and I thought they were amazing. And I don't know if they broke up or what happened, but I haven't heard from them in a couple of years. And then um, I think I love vibes. I love the vibe of Rival Sons. I think their vibe, the singer's spectacular. The band is all amazing musicians. I saw them in a tiny, tiny club before they broke on the second floor of Avalon, I think. People were sitting on the floor. And I'm like, who the, who are these guys? I was blown away. But now, again, I love the vibe, but I, I don't think on any of their records is there a breakout smash chorus. So I hope I hope on future endeavors they, they write something that really hits the bullseye. So, um, but again, uh, I think, I'm the wrong guy to ask because I, if I'm going to put something on, it's going to be ACDC, like back in black, like 40 years old this month. Yep. Right? And it's oh, still that's, on the that's, that's record, top to bottom. Still one of the best sounding records of all time. So it's hard to compete with that. You know, even though I've been around for 40 years, I, you don't get tired of it. So I'm that guy that, you know, will put on Zeppelin 2 or – I want to listen to Black Dog or do a cover of Black Dog and and put that up on YouTube. I think that came out really good with Dan and uh, Brian Tishy on drums. Um, yeah, that's all right. I'm pushing my shit. Why <laughs> uh, from YouTube ass? What was your first guitar? My first guitar? Yeah. My first guitar was a uh, – everybody's first guitar is usually a, a copy. Mine was a copy of a hollow body teardrop box. Nice. With really terrible pickups and some kind of cheap, cheap, cheap Bigsby. And um, it looked like it was made out of particle board, I think. Cause it, my dad, I was five. So, and I was living, we were a modest ho household. So for my dad to buy a five year old and a electric guitar that he could barely hold. That, that was pretty spectacular to me as a kid. And I look back and it's still spectacular to me. But he was like, look, uh, we don't, we're, we're, we got a small apartment here. If we can't lay it anywhere, it doesn't fit under the couch. If you want to play it, I'm going to hang it on this wall. Just tell me when you want to play it and I'll bring it down. So one day I was at school and he, I wasn't at school and he was at work. So I wanted to play it. So I, you know, I, I took a, a chair and a phone book and a box and something else, <laughs> like a, a cartoon. And I reached up and I could not support the weight of it over my head, so it smashed when it hit the ground, kind of split in half. My dad was uh, a handy guy, so some clamps and some glue, <laughs> it was it was fun. But uh, when I say particle board, it was because like one particle never made it back. <laughs> Do you think the fact that it kind of looked like a bazooki may have influenced his purchase decision in buying the teardrop guitar? Yes. You know what, man? I, I didn't even think about that until a month ago. I was thinking, hey, man, teardrop is kind of like a bazooki. And he, I always think he wanted me to play, he played bazooki. 
So I always think he wanted me to play guitar so he could have accompaniment. <laughs> hey, Phil, people are over. We're going to play some uh, bazooki. <laughs> oh, my God, that's funny. I, I, I have to ask you this one story. We were hanging out last summer, and it's, it's so funny because when I click on Phil X Riff Lords on Gibson TV, an ad keeps popping up for feta cheese. And it's like, how, I mean, are they really specifically branding this? But you, you're obviously a Greek man. There's yeah. a couple of, of very Greek things that you don't participate in at all. And I one of them is feta cheese. Will you tell everybody why as a Greek person you don't eat feta cheese? Um, Cause I mean, it was, my dad had it on the table for every meal of the day. And uh, I just, I didn't like the smell. And I was like, oh my God. Do we have to smell this cheese that smells like feet every meal? Of the I'm having Cheerios and there's a bit of cheese on the table, right? So, I mean, I mean that was the, that was the one thing for me. I mean, I like cheese and I like all kinds of cheeses, but feta is not my in my bag, man. Not really. But it's funny that there's feta cheese commercials on the Riff Lords video. You told me Speaking of which, aren't those aren't those commercials like totally ruining the flow of videos these days? We actually don't monetize Gibson TV at all. We make no money from Gibson TV specifically, so there won't be advertisements in front of anything. Uh -huh. But there happens to be a copyright thing, or the record label didn't uh, whitelist a song that we got cleared or something. Ads start going up, and it's ads for feta cheese. Uh, now, okay, you remember the feta cheese conversation, but I now, you mentioned us hanging in Nashville, and I took the two tours. Yeah. Uh, of the factories and I was completely blown away and that's because people are like you know how come you never went with Gibson earlier and I was always I love Gibson Gibson guitars I always had Gibson guitars but I feel like I didn't think the quality control was great um but man you I got reeled in when I went on those tours because I mean not only is the quality controls incredible now but everybody that I talk to, because I'm the guy that's talking, or like somebody will recognize me and go, hey man, it's Phil X. I'm like, hey man, what are you doing? Oh, I'm putting binding on this Les Paul. Oh, I'm wiring this SG pickup. Oh, I'm doing this. Everybody loves their job. Yeah. And then you go to the, a CNC machine and the guy presses a button and it totally digs out the cavity and whatever guitar. You're like, this is incredible. But everybody, it was just like a big family, which is very appealing to me because I'm very family oriented. Grew up family oriented, married into a family oriented. It's just, it's, it's that thing. So that's why Gibson is rocking my world. Very cool. Well, speaking of family, uh, Rich from Facebook asked, "Do you plan on teaching your kids how to play guitar?" Well, uh, they can play anything they want. My son's got a, a little flying V. I got, got it. That's got Spider Man on it. I got. It. Yeah, see, it's that one. Yeah, but my son's flying. I got it. My buddy, made a skin. my buddy made a skin for it and uh, it's got Spider-Man on it. And so he loves it. And then one time he's like, I tuned it open G sharp. So at least wherever he strums and puts his hand, one finger, you can get like notes and stuff. But the funny thing is he's, he watched me, he saw me pick slide one time. So one day he's walking around and he goes, daddy, can I plug in? He's <laughs> holding the jack. I'm like, sure, man, here, plug into this little thing. So he plugs into the end, and all he did was like, pick slides for like 30 minutes. That was a, that was a very joyous 30 minutes. Um, uh, he's got a drum kit upstairs that he got from Tico Torres, a w, DW kit, and we have a piano. And this is, I, I'm trying not to guide them. I'm trying to see where they navigate to on their own. But when my son play, he sits at the piano, and you can see – him completely get sucked into this tonal instrument and he's figuring out intervals and he's figuring out octaves all by himself and he's you know now he's created a melody and he's now he's got a chorus so he's got this melody and he keeps playing this melody and i figure out he's in c so he's playing he's playing and then when i think he's done i go to the low end and I go, dude, check this out. Boom, and the C. And he's like, Daddy, you ruined it. <laughs> so kids, 
make everything awesome. Yeah. And I'm sticking to that one. It's funny. I showed my oldest son, Nico, your episode of Riff Lords. And the very next day, he, he woke up. He woke me up at like six o'clock in the morning. And he walked in with this flying V. And he had a Batman action figure tucked under the strings here. Like, oh, man. Phil's That's amazing. Phil's rubbing up on my boy. Couldn't really play. It wasn't in the cavity, but it was under the strings. And How old is he? He's, uh, he was five. Uh, turned six. Love it. Yeah. Loving the Phil X. Hey, I got another question just come in here uh, from Dudamel Guitar on YouTube. What are the top three venues that you've ever played? Top three favorite favorite venues to play? Um, okay. Uh, wow. Okay. Um, it's usually, it's usually, um, I gotta say two are, are with Bon Jovi because, uh, um, they're kind of the dream venues when you're a young musician. So Madison Square Garden, but the thing with Madison Square Garden in 2018 was that we did two sold out nights back to back and the morning of the second show, which was Friday, I, I went to the power station and recorded Liberty DeVito on drums on a drills tune. That's coming out of volume two. And um, so that was, and then, so, okay, so we record Liberty DeVito on my song and I'm like freaking out. Cause we, we, we met during the hired gun sessions. Yeah. Documentary. We totally hit it off. And what, what, what I found magnetizing watching him play was that he's like in his mid sixties and he plays like a kid. And I'm like, Oh my God, I got this guy in the drills record. So when he agreed to do it at the power station, no less, that was an incredible moment. And then we, we went and had lunch and then me and Obi O'Brien, uh, the Bon Jovi broadcast engineer, he, we walked to Madison Square Garden to have soundtrack for night two. So that whole thing for me, that whole day was an incredible experience. Um, obviously, Wembley, it's not the exact same building where Live Aid and Queen and Zeppelin played, but it is the same name and the same concept. Um, and then uh, the drills, when we played in uh, Scotland, it was my birthday. Um, we played in Edinburgh. And Edinburgh, I, I, I don't say anything right. Um, and this place called the Capes, that was like when you weren't playing, you were walking around going, oh my, look at this room, look at this room, look, what's this? It's like incredible. It, apparently somebody was putting a hole in a wall and found these caves right beside his house. So that was one of the coolest venues I've ever played. And uh, there's some really cool footage from there. And somebody took footage of me playing, I think, Beautiful Apartment from that balcony. And uh, it was it was pretty amazing. It's great to have a birthday in an incredible, if you can't be home for your birthday with the, with the kids and the wife and family, then might as well be in an incredible venue in Scotland. Yeah. Uh, both you and I, uh, through YouTube, got to play some pretty incredible vintage guitars. Uh, you are on Credit Americana, me at Norm's. Uh, another question from YouTube came in. What is the best vintage Gibson that you ever got a chance to play? Okay. Um, I still remember uh, it's at Credit Americana. I, I did 500 guitars. So there's one, one, one guitar that sticks out. And it was a 1958 ES-335 mint played itself like yeah. i feel like i wasn't even playing like i was having an outer body experience watching me play this guitar play itself does that even make sense i don't yeah. know but it does because sometimes they do that it does it, it was it's still ingrained in my brain now the cool thing about that was it wasn't even a fred and americana thing i found a 1964 SG Jr. that I always wanted a white one. I, love uh, that. I always, and I could never, I, I've been at guitar shows where you pick up five and none of them say, hey man, I'm the one. So I found one in December around Christmas time. It was a Christmas present to myself. I mean, it's a player because somebody tuned the pegs, I mean, uh, swapped out the tuning pegs and, uh, and probably gave it a refret 
And but I never play a guitar for an hour. I mean, I only play a guitar in a music store ever, not even for five minutes. But I could not put this thing down. I was just plugged into a little Fender Tweet thing, and I played that guitar for an hour. And it's like, oh, now we got to go to the Gibson party down the street. And uh, and that's the night I went. I went to the Gibson party, and I had you know the shitty cases that those guitars came in, right? Oh, Card with a layer of fake alligator and shit. Yeah. And uh, I walked in and they're like, what, what's that? Um, I, I just got this 1964 HG Junior. I opened up the case and everybody's like, what up, this thing's amazing. And Beth's like, I'm taking it to my office right now. I'm like, awesome, I'll come and get it later. So, I mean, those are the, the but the 58, out of all the guitars I played at Fred, Fred and Americano, it was the ES335. Yeah, definitely. Uh, if you guys still got questions for Phil, we're, 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 I mean, we don't have a set time on this, but we're getting up to an hour here. If you got questions, get them in now. A couple more here. Another question, uh, Zavir from uh, Facebook asks, uh, if you could jam with any guitarist, who would you want to jam with? I think, I mean, you know, me being an Ed geek for the longest time, it was Ed, but I think, I think Jimmy Page. I think, yeah. uh, I have a top three. I think Joe Walsh is in the top three. I think Beck is definitely in the top three and Jimmy Page. Jimmy Page would be it because he, not just uh, an incredible songwriter and producer, but he was so uh, ahead of his time with, with all that stuff, all three, all, the trifecta of writing, producing, and playing. So he's definitely a guy that would be like an incredible hang. And Which jam. song do you want to jam? Oh, I mean, I think we'd start from scratch. <laughs> <laughs> Just start going to the yeah, he starts playing something, and I start playing something to it, and then I'm, I'm writing a melody and lyrics on top of it, and then before we know it, we're recording. And then we have tea. <laughs> uh, let's see here. I'm just going through uh, any other of these questions here. Um, see if we got any other good ones here. Oh, some, this is another dumb one, sorry. How do you get the lines on your beard so straight? Is there a technique, a shaving technique that you use? I know, we're running out of stuff here, man. You know what? It's not even that symmetrical. I don't know what you're talking about. See, okay, this is, I hold my, whole, my head on, a, on an angle, and then it looks straight. <laughs> <laughs> um, wait a minute, I see one, wait. I see one here, can I answer it? Go for it. How, uh, Abracast one from YouTube. How was it recording at Dave Grohl's 606 studio playing some cover tunes? It sounded amazing. Um, first of all, yeah, it's an amazing studio with an amazing control room and an amazing um, uh, sound room. It was amazing. And, and you could, they have, when you go to that studio, they're like, hey, what amp do you want to use? I brought my own amp, but they had a great amp for Dan to use on bass. They got some great bass tones. But I want to say it was uh, John um, Lou. John Lusteau was the engineer there, and he made he made he mic'd everything up and made it sound amazing. But Smiley, Sean Smiley, he mixed that stuff, and it's like the drum sounded amazing, the bass sounded amazing, and it's a guitar show. But it's like, and it's funny when people are like, "Man, Phil, you're great, but that bass sounds amazing." I'm like, "Yeah, it does. I know." Or, "Man, I'm sorry, Phil, but those drums they stole the show." I'm like, "Why are you sorry?" I want everything to sound great too. Is that Neve all that it's cracked up to be? I'm, I mean, I'm a huge Neve fan, anyways, and I've, I've worked in so many studios, and Neve is probably the one that's in most. And that one, yeah, kicks ass. I mean, it's great. Like, I love going to a studio, and I, it's funny, but also they're like you're in a channel, and there's some crackling, and the, it's like if a pedal doesn't work, right? You're like. You know, well, give me a second. I just got to do this for five minutes, and then that, and, this, and then the, the channel works again. Or they go, they're like, okay, wait, it's a little noisy. Give it a second. <laughs> and the board, man, that one that one channel strip is probably worth thousands and thousands of dollars, and they gotta like get the WD forty. <laughs> you have a favorite room to record in in LA? You have so, a favorite studio? Um, you know what? Their NRG is amazing. Um, Capitol Records, where we did uh, Right on the Money, that was uh, Room B. That that room is pretty 
outstanding. And it's Chris Lord famous favorite room in the city. I like going I like going to Sunset Sound because that's where Van Halen recorded one, two, and three. I think three. But yeah. Um because you can take a picture of that one room where they're set up, where you yeah. see the baffles and the window, and they're like, oh my god, that's the shot. And wait, there's the vocal booth with that famous David Lee Roth on the microphone shot. And, and I mean, I get you know, I geek out over, over stuff like that. But um, you know, this the city's amazing for that. It's amazing, even if you go to East West Studios, where I actually got a couple of sessions at the end of the month, but you go to East West Studios. And uh, it used to be cello for years and years and years. And you go into the big room, which is really amazing. And you see this podium and you're like, what's with that podium? Um, oh, that's uh, where Frank Sinatra used to sing. <laughs> I'm like, okay, there's some history. Hey, what's with this hole in the wall? Oh yeah, River uh, Rivers Cuomo was riding around in his Vespa in here and he lost control and his foot went into the wall. So we just kept it. <laughs> There's incredible history in, in Los Angeles with uh, movie sets. Like, uh, it was a and it was It's Henson now. So Jim Henson bought A&M. Now, Henson Studios is still famous, still busy. Well, right. actually, I don't know now that COVID's going on. But uh, some of the best studios around are in Henson. And it used to be A&M Records. They had offices and used the soundstage for parties and did recordings there. And... Before that, it was Charlie Chaplin soundstage. So the history here is like when A and M had it, they still had a little uh, statue of Charlie Chaplin on the roof. And uh, when Henson took over, they got Kermit the Frog dressed as Charlie Chaplin on the roof. So it's, I mean, there's so much stuff that happened in L.A. so many years ago. Or you walk into a room and they're like, "Hey, the Doors recorded here," or "Hey, Zeppelin." Uh, recorded here or somebody recorded there. It's it's pretty incredible what uh, what you uh, what you get to experience when you're walking from studio to studio here. No, yeah. hey, for everybody who's out there who might not be familiar with the PhilX app, can you tell everybody a little bit about your app and what all uh, what all people can uh, can do in there? Well, this is um, yeah, it's uh, basically it's the PhilX app and. We have, you can be a subscriber and there's a basic plan. And then there's what we call premier members with exclusive content. And uh, so say I do a live chat. I do live chats like this, except it's more like less questions and I, a lot of requests. I, I do a lot of tunes, um, a lot of drill stuff and some covers. Today was somebody was like, hey man, do some heart. So I did like Barracuda. And I'm like, I didn't know I could hit that note at 10 a.m. But uh, it's like, uh, so if somebody goes, hey man, do Back in Black, you go. But if you're a premier member, you get to request songs and do a Q&A. You can ask me questions and you can correspond with everybody that's talking. It's actually pretty amazing because somebody's like, sorry, I'm late. I wasn't feeling good. And then 12 people go, well, I hope you feel better. I mean, it's like it's like a incredible family. Yeah, that's so cool. Phil, I want to thank you uh, for taking the time to chat with us. Uh, check out the Phil X app. If you haven't seen Phil X's uh, episode of Riff Lords, it's on Gibson TV. It's fantastic. Some excellent uh, drill songs on there. Some classic Bon Jovi. Uh, can't wait to get you back out in the Nashville so we can hang, start working on this guitar, man. Yeah, it all men. We're waiting for it. Well, thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you, Gibson, for being incredible. And uh, Mark, and thank you for uh, moderating and chatting. And I love it when it feels like we're just having coffee in a coffee shop with a guitar. <laughs> thank you guys for watching. Phil X and Mark Agnesi from Gibson. We'll see you guys soon. Thank Peace. you. Thanks. <laughs>